Welcome to the MyLifeInConcert.com podcast. I'm your host, Various Artists, and please join me as I travel back and revisit every live show I've seen from 1975 to the present. As I have been creating episodes for the MyLifeInConcert.com series, I've been reliving a bunch of concert-going firsts dating from my you know early days of concert-going. For instance, episode two in the series looks at the very first concert I ever went to, uh, Roxy Music here at the London Arena here in London, Ontario, Canada in February of 75. Skipping ahead to concert number three, which was episode eight, uh, I looked at Elvis Costello and the attractions here at Alumni Hall in November of 78. And that was the first time I had seen any artist from sort of the punk or new wave scene that I had been following for years. Also, it was my first time in a concert hall. My other concerts had been in these big shed-like places. Concert number four, which was episode 12, looked at the jam at the Rex Danforth Theatre in Toronto in April of 79. Now, there was a bunch of firsts for that one. It was my first show outside of London, Ontario. It was my first show in Toronto. It was the first show I saw at a small, intimate theater. And it was the first show I saw with a sort of a genuine punk audience or whatever you want to say. And then, of course, in uh, for concert number five or episode 13, where I saw my first live shows in a bar here at the Cedar Lounge here in London with local acts, NFG, the Regulators and the Sinners. Skip ahead to concert number eight, which was episode 10, and it's the Heatwave Festival. That was the first festival I ever went to in August of 1980, along with a few other non-musical firsts as well. Now, the show I'm going to be looking at today has three firsts. Uh, number one, it was the first of three police picnics, big festivals hosted by the titular band. Number two, it was the first show I saw with a friend of mine from that period. We were big music fans, but bizarrely, we hadn't seen a show together until this point. And as for the other first, well, you'll just have to listen to me, your host, various artists. This is the MyLifeInConcert.com podcast, and it's episode 15, concert number nine, number nine, number nine, number nine, The Boiler. The Police Picnic 81 with The Police, The Specials, Iggy Pop, Killing Joke, The Go-Go's, Nash the Slash, John Otway and Wild Willie Barrett, The Paolas, Oingo Boingo, and the David Bendeth Band at The Grove, Oakville, Ontario, Canada, August 23rd, 1981, exactly one year to the day after Heat Wave. As with Heat Wave, it was a $20 concert, and that $20, uh, when factored into current Canadian currency, works out to just under $60. So even taking inflation into account, this was an amazing deal of a show. Also, once again, I have a special guest, special guests from Leeds, UK, who was living here at the time. A friend of mine, he's been on a few episodes, and he's here once again today. Actually, he's going to be in the next several episodes, and he's going to be sharing some great uh, memories that he has from the event. Basically, most of the podcast today is us talking together about our memories of each of the bands on the bill. Just a reminder to visit the MyLifeInConcert.com website where you can not only hear the podcasts, but also go back and read all my original blog entries that I wrote uh, for OpenSalon.com uh, back uh, a decade ago. Most of these podcast episodes that I'm doing, there's a corresponding blog entry. Well, for all of them, but most of them there's a detailed corresponding blog entry with extra information along with photos, ephemera, music, video links, etc. Especially for today's episode, I have a pretty lengthy blog entry that goes into a lot more detail and memories and things that happen. So if you enjoyed the podcast today, definitely uh, go to the website and check out the original blog entry I wrote back in 2010. I'd also like to announce and plug a new offshoot of MyLifeInConcert.com called My Life in Conversation discussions with creatives. Now this is a new video series that I'm doing where I interview people from various creative communities and I am proud to announce episode one is up featuring Stevie Wonder co-producer, electronic music pioneer, an all-round audio and engineering innovator and legend Robert Margoloff who discusses his role as film producer of one of the all-time classic cult films. 
1972's Chow Manhattan, starring the iconic and tragic 1960s Warhol superstar Edie Sedgwick, who died while the film was in post-production. Uh, in the episode, Robert discusses how he came to be involved in filmmaking in the New York underground of the 60s, the challenges of making Chow Manhattan in amidst just drug craze madness, what we can learn from the film, why Edie's legacy endures, and his involvement in a new Sedgwick-related project, Too Late, an animated short by filmmaker Kinga Sirek. Uh, please tune in as Robert has so many great stories to tell about Edie, the era, making the movie, and also about the early electronic music scene. You can watch the video on the mylifeinconcert.com website or on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash mylifeinconcert. You can also listen to all of the podcasts uh, on our YouTube channel, along with other assorted vids, uh, including stuff, uh, footage that Cublet and I have shot at various shows through the years that I have discussed or will be discussing. I also create playlists on Spotify to go with the episodes, and because my pen name of various artists is not easy to find on Spotify, you can search for my playlists as they all begin with M-L-I-C, followed by a greater than symbol or prompt. So I have a playlist up for this episode entitled MLIC greater than the boiler colon police picnic 81 playlist, my life in concert.com EP 15 concert number nine, as well as a series of audio diaries that are chronological lists of key tracks and artists I was listening to during the era, especially in between, um, in the last episode, I looked at the boomtown rats from March of 1980 and today we're in. August of 81. So I've got those MLIC greater than VA's 1980 or 1981, the soundtrack to my year, mylifeinconcert.com, blah, blah. So if you like some of the bands and music I have been focusing on from that time, check out the playlist. You may enjoy them. I also have similar ones up for 75, 78, 79. I'm going to do them as I go along in the series. Also, please like, follow, subscribe, and comment on our Facebook and Instagram pages. In fact, if you were at any of these shows that I've been talking about, please leave your memories, what you recall about the shows at the mylifeinconcert.com site or the YouTube channel, blah, blah, blah. So following my last episode, uh, episode 14, which looked at the Boomtown Rat Show at the London Gardens in March of 1980, it was concert number six. Following that, two months later, I saw one of the best shows I've ever seen, and that was the Ramones and the Demics at Centennial Hall in May, and I did that episode a while back. It's episode three, concert number seven. And then a month or so after that, it was June, and I finished grade 12 of my high school, and I absolutely hated high school with a passion at this point, and think back, and yeah, I would hate it every, maybe even more uh, now, so I hated it at the time. I was so relieved that the school year was over, and it was a time of a lot of conflict in my life, you know, in my family life, with me, uh, in and around me at that time. So I moved out that summer. I was sort of an au pair of sorts in the summer of 1980, um, and I've written about that in the Heat Wave episode. Also, too, I'm working on an oral history episode for Heat Wave. So if you were at the festival, want to talk, you have memories contact me at info at mylifeinconcert.com. Anyway, summer ended, uh, heat wave happened at the end, have written and talked all about that. And in the fall, I returned back home and back to school to finish grade 13, my last year of high school. And as much as I really hated being there and I was counting every minute until it ended, there was a bit of a sea change in that last year because I was the school punk rock guy and then made a few other friends in that regard. But there was a lot of hostility aimed at me. And that changed a lot over that summer because, as I've mentioned in a few other episodes, in Canada at the end of 79, but particularly through 1980, there was an explosion of popularity of bands that had, you know, new bands from the last few years from punk and new wave. And they, it, 1980 was about the closest thing Canada had to say in 1977 in Britain. So I was a very different proposition for people at that point. There's people literally who had threatened me before who are now coming up and trying to be chummy with me. I like, 
Where do you buy your clothes? Who does your hair? Where can we buy those shoes? Where can we get this? What about this band? Are they any good? And it's like, beat it. But at the same time, that last year, I did meet a number of great people who were into interesting music and culture in general. Basically, we lived in the art room when we were not in any other classes. So that last year wasn't too bad. I particularly remember the art room had a copy of that compilation, The Beatles, 67 to 70, and that's one we could all agree on. So there's a, actually some nice memories of hanging out in that room and playing that compilation over and over. But you know, I just hated high school and couldn't wait for it to end. Also, the disappointment of that fall, which I've also discussed in my episode on shows that I missed, I was supposed to see XTC in November and Bob Marley in December, and both shows got canceled. So that sucked. So 80 turned into 81, and then it was June, and then I was out of school. And I think my last day of high school remains for me one of the most personally satisfying days of my entire life. And I didn't even go to my graduation. And for two reasons. One, because it would be hypocritical. I hated the place. I hated being there. I couldn't wait to get out. I had no interest in going back from a gra for a graduation. And also, two, actually on the night of my graduation, I went to the New Yorker Cinema, the Rep Cinema here in the city, and they had a showing of The Clash's Rude Boy. And it was pretty wild. A little mini riot broke out. The cops showed up. So that was a much more interesting and meaningful evening to me. So at this point in my story, it's the late summer of 81. I'm sort of going to be going to college to do some financial stuff, which is like the last thing I should have been doing. And I dropped out within a year. But at this point, I'd been uh, working at City Hall over the summer. I had a summer job there working in the offices. And this concert, this police picnic, turned out to be the one and only show I saw in 1981. Even though I'd been seeing more live music in the years previous, and that trend would continue in the future, 1981 is, is a bit of an odd year. It's just this one show. And in fact, it wouldn't be until 1996 before I had another single concert year. Now, as for why, it's just, I had some friends that were into music, but they really weren't into shows. That changed later, but they weren't at the time. Also, I'd gone to see a lot of shows with my sister and brother-in-law, and they weren't going out as much, and they were kind of getting out of the scene. And so there was this little period where I wasn't seeing much live music I had before, and that was about to change in a big way. But admittedly, for one concert, it was, this was a great show to see for that year. So exactly one year on from Heat Wave, here I was once again, sitting outside in a, fe in a field for an all-day festival in the baking sun, it indeed was the boiler. Now, as I mentioned, the police picnic was uh, hosted and put together by the police uh, who headlined the event. And unlike Heat Wave, this was a very different personal experience. Now, as for those of you who have listened to the episode, and I encourage you to do so, it's a fun one. The Heat Wave weekend was basically uh, just a celebration of debauchery and no goodery and all sorts of things. It was quite a memory. Police Picnic 1, by contrast, was a little bit more of a June Cleaver sort of pop and hot dogs aff affair. They were so strict with alcohol coming in. We probably had something to drink in the parking lot beforehand, but I don't remember us having any sort of ingestibles. We probably had beans or bennies, you know, but that was probably it. It was pretty much just, you know, pop and buy and hot dogs and... Uh, so a very different experience from the previous and also the subsequent police picnics, which are far more messier affairs, but we'll be getting to those soon enough, or you can read about them on the blog. Now, in terms of the lead up to the festival or how I came to be there, I'm not quite as clear on this one, but this is what I seem to recall is I really wanted to go, and my friend Lady B really wanted to go. But I know I didn't get my driver's license till the fall of 81. I think she had hers, but she didn't have a car. 
Um, we didn't know anyone who would lend us a car, so there was no way of getting there because, again, this was way out in the middle of nowhere. You needed a car to get there. And I think it was a case where we had been wanting to go, but we had no way of getting there. And right about this time, she started seeing someone. And it was one of those things where they went out for just a few weeks and then it just wasn't going to go anywhere and it ended. This was right in this period. She started seeing this guy. He drove. She had mentioned the festival. He's like, sure, I'll go. That could be fun. I'll drive. So this person who I literally couldn't pick out of a police lineup if my life depended on it, obviously a very nice guy. We all got in his car, drove down, and we all went together. Uh, so whoever you may be, uh, guy, we'll call the driving guy, driving guy out there, thank you very much for getting us there and back. You did a good thing, and hey, you had a fun time and saw a great festival as well. So at this point, I'm going to transition over to my interview with special guests, and that's going to take up most of the rest of the episode. I'm going to inject just a couple of times. So when I'm going to transition between me narrating here and my interview, when I go to that transition, you'll hear this sound and you'll know that we're going from the interview back to the narration. Okay. So we're going to go to the interview. So, okay, do your thing, guy. So I'm talking once again with special guests. Say hello, special guests. Hello. And a uh, special guest has joined me in, uh, for episode three on the Ramones and, of course, episode 14 on the Boomtown Rat Show just a few months before the Ramones. And he's joining me here today because he, too, went to the police picnic one in 1981, and he's going to be sharing his memories from the show. Now, to start off, is um, were you a big fan? Now, the, there was many bands on the bill. And we'll start with the police as headliners. Were you a big fan of the band? Um, maybe talk a bit about that. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I was a huge fan of the police. I had, I had, they were on the third album at that time, weren't they? So I had all three, three albums. So was, yeah, I was, I loved them back then. Now there was quite a number of bands on the bill. Were there any others besides the police that you were also interested in seeing that day? Yeah, I was really looking forward to seeing the specials um, and Killing Joke. I wanted to see at their album. Um, I wanted to see what the Go Go's were like. I didn't really know much of them. I don't think I had the album because yeah, uh, I think that album had they had it had just come out and they were yeah. they were barely known that they were just about to sort of hit. Which makes it interesting why they were so high up on the bill. I'm wondering if that had anything to do with the specials. Because uh, I think in, in California, I, even though they hadn't put their album out, they certainly in Southern California, they had a following. But I know this, well, there was the connection with the specials because, of course, yeah. Terry Hall and Jane Wheedlin. Jane Wheedlin wrote Our Lips Are Sealed, which Fun Boy 3 yeah. and the Go-Go's each covered. Because yeah. that song is about their affair. Well, um, they opened the first American tour for the specials. Ah, uh, okay. Interesting. Yes, so that was, you yeah, know, they were having their, sec their secret affair, not the band's secret affair. <laughs> um, but that's sort of what that song was about. So, once again, this is a gig that was way out in the middle of nowhere. It was a festival yep. in Oakville, an hour and a half away. Do you have any memories about you know, going to the festival, uh, being there, that sort of thing, arriving, the, the location, anything in that regard? Um, yeah, I do. I, I remember driving up and then um, getting out and thinking, oh, God, I was, you know, really excited of, for it to all get started. But I remember sort of them checking everybody for booze. Um, and I think I remember seeing a big pile of booze as well in, in, in some container next to where they were just sort of just throwing it in because you know, people were trying to bring it in because you couldn't take any in and, um, and that's what's incredible about that mm -hmm. time when i think back to it none of these shows had booze at them which 
was normal then, but I have a hard time wrapping my head around that now. I know it's it's unbelievable. You can't think of it, you know, that that would have been the case. And it makes you think, well, how did you get through the day? (laughs) Not that I needed to have alcohol in the day, especially when I was that age, but, you know, it just would make you think, well, you know, you're at a concert, you need to, you know, that kind of goes hand in hand. Exactly, because today that's one of the key things. It's also part of a key part of the revenue stream for the venues and these places. Yeah. yeah. But back then in Canada, especially liquor, um, liquor laws and liquor control laws were, were much more controlled. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because this was the second festival I went to after Heat Wave in 1980. Mm-hmm. And from 80 to 83, I went to a festival every summer. Then I didn't see a festival for a number of years, and the next one was Lollapalooza 1992, which is actually episode four in the series. And that one, they had beer tents, uh, alcohol was there. So somewhere in between the early 80s and the early 90s, that changed here. But I don't know when or why. It would be interesting to find out. Yeah. You know know, what the reasons were and when it changed. So I think the, the the festival I went to after the police picnics, I didn't go to any festivals until 1998, which is, you know, I was over here, and that was Glastonbury in 1998. Um, yeah. That was the first time going to a festival after, which is, you know, completely different experience. <laughs> also, too, those, like, festivals, the festivals all had sort of started, especially in sort of rock music or the rock music yeah. world in the late, 60s and 70s Mm -hmm. and but still you know even you look at Woodstock and it's just people on a stage and it's incredible how high tech they've become and this I think by this point Mm -hmm. it was still in an evolution process and especially for a lot of the more newer music acts that were on this bill the idea of the festivals with these acts that were coming out of punk which was supposed to be smaller there was I don't want to use the word controversy, might be a little too harsh, but there was, I know certainly among people I knew, people, like I'm very glad I went to this festival, and I'm quite sure you are. Yes. And saw the others, but there were people where it's like, you know, unless it's in between four walls and a couple hundred people, I don't want to go. But anyway, yeah. whatever. I'm glad I went. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I remember seeing somebody comment about it, about it recently saying, Oh, I wish I wish I'd gone now because they st- they said they thought they were probably too cool to go to it because it was the police. <laughs> yeah. So, do you have any memories about arriving at the gig, the venue, being in that kind of environment? Because I-, I believe you said this was your first festival. Yes, yes, it was. Um, I just remember th- there was. Uh, I just remember thinking it was. It just felt like I was in a. Th- farmer's field somewhere because there was um straw underfoot it felt like straw anyway um and it was just open there wasn't sort of there was no sort of areas to you know if it was hot it was a hot day i think i can remember but there was no way yes there's no sort of tents or anything you know like in festivals now you can go and there's like maybe might be beer tents or there might be places to sit down sometimes uh, but nothing like that at all. It was just like they'd stuck a stage in a field. Which was the way to do it at that point in time. You know, it was yeah. an evolutionary thing, which for me at the time was, wow. And now I look back and it's like, wow, this was pretty primitive. Yeah, yeah, especially if you see, when you look at the, the old footage, on, if you see it, find it on YouTube, and you look at the stage set up and you think, God, it just looks like a few planks of wood and some scaffolding. I believe you correctly described the stage area. (laughs) (laughs) So in terms of the artists on the bill, we can Uh talk about who was on the bill. Now, the day opened with the David Bendeth band. Do you, I'll talk about that in a moment. Just wondering, do you have any memories of that? No, not at all. I don't remember them. I don't remember. Um, I can, uh, when, when, after you've said it, you know, I didn't, I didn't even remember they were on the bill. I didn't. I can't remember them at all. But the, the Canadian band. Yes, uh, 
what sticks out in my mind is, of course, this is all music. Well, Iggy Pop preceded all this, but a lot of this was music that came out of sort of the punk and new wave realm from the mid to later 70s. And, of course, there was, at the time, sort of in the late 70s, disco was sort of the enemy. And especially 1980, I see, is the switch year because that's when I started incorporating a lot more rhythmic music back into my listening. And a key part of that was actually seeing the Talking Heads at Heat Wave and yeah. uh, the Remain in Light album, but also a lot of the post-punk bands I was listening to like PIL and Gang of Four, where yeah. really the basis of the music was funk and sort of rhythmic uh -huh. with all the sort of guitar on top. And Van Death Band was basically a funk, disco-y, R&B band, but they were embraced by the audience. And I remember thinking sort of mo like first with, with punk that opened a lot of minds and brought down a lot of walls. Mm -hmm. But that, I think at this time was kind of turning into, especially with the sort of the second wave of punk, another sort of trap in itself. And I remember thinking it's now time to sort of open up more and thinking, okay, things were changing, but I felt in a positive way because the more interesting aspects of music were becoming more exploratory and uh, inclusive, if you agree or make sense, I, I don't know. But that's kind of one of the things I remember was this is a bit of a shift, but it's a good shift and it's a healthy shift to a more broader palette, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's how I see it. So some of the other acts that were on sort of in the early part of the day, I can't remember the exact order, but there was the Paolas from Vancouver. There yeah. was Boingo Boingo from L.A., yeah. Uh, do you have any memories of either of those? A, a little bit. I think I remember Oingo Boingo a bit more than Paola's. Because I liked, I think I, I had their album, one of their albums as well. I think the first one. So I knew some of some of the stuff. So I enjoyed them. I remember Oingo Boingo. I wasn't actually that into them, but I remember them. I remember them more than the Paola's. I actually had forgotten that the Paola's were on the bill. But yeah. I actually knew the pale as I didn't know Oingo Boingo. But I was kind of, I wasn't all that big of them. But then, of course, Danny Elfman went on to write the Simpsons yeah. theme. Yeah, and, 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 and a lot of film music as well, didn't he? So there's a lot of uh, stuff for Tim Burton. Tim Burton, right, 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 of course. One act from earlier in the day that I have a very clear memory of and really enjoyed whereas most of the crowd did not, is do you remember the set by John Otway and Wild Billy Barrett? Yes, I remember that. I do yeah. remember it. I remember. I think I remember enjoying it, but I do remember the crowd not getting into it either. But I'm just wondering, I don't know whether it's the, the, them or whether the fact that maybe because it was just two guys. I think it was just too out there for most people. The the humor also, too, is very minimalist. It's just him and a guitar with Wild Willy, uh, John Otway. I really liked his set. That was one of my favorite sets of the day, but it was cut yeah. short because they were basically pelted off the stage. Oh, I don't remember that. <laughs> oh, yeah, they were booed and pelted. They, I think the set was cut short. All right. <laughs> um, hey there, me again, the narration butting in. Actually, one of the best memories I have of that day, and it's so clear is John Otway and Wild Willie Barrett on stage doing, Cool, baby, that's really free. And it was it was hilarious. They were getting pelted with everything, but hey, what can you say? Still, out of all of the music from that day, that's one of the clearest memories that I have. Anyway, we'll go back. Hey, do your thing, guy. There was also, we'd also talked about Killing Joke. Yeah. Uh, now you were, did you say that you'd had, you had their first album? Yes. I really enjoyed them. I, mean, I really liked the album, so I was really into. You know, they thought they were very good. They again, that was one of my favorite sets of the day, and I'd really been into post punk. That had been my thing since the later seventy mm -hmm. nine, and they were really. Although they weren't my favorite band out of that group, I did like them. I loved the first album, 
and mm-hmm. I knew them, but I remember the set. I really, really liked their set. It was one of my favorites of the day. I thought they were terrific. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, the other thing I remember is the disconnect between this really dark music, and it's like they came on like bright sunshine outside. <laughs> it was like sort of middle of the day, wasn't it? It was like, well, about two in the afternoon, something like that. Right? It was, it was, was earlier late? on. Oh, was it? Yeah. What so time did it start? I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember. One thing I do know about the festival we'll get to, it ran way over. The police didn't come on till almost midnight. Um, and I said, because yeah, I, I had to work the remember. next day. <laughs> really? <laughs> and we're, anyway, we'll get to that in a bit. But Killing Joke, I remember. Also, Nash the Slash. And Nash, Nash the Slash, I believe his set, was cut because of time restraints and he got very pissed off as well he should have been Mm. so i didn't remember him um until it got mentioned a little while ago and i don't and then a friend of so another friend of mine said do you do you remember his second cut and i was like no so i didn't remember him and I remember him going over well, but they cut his set short because things were running so behind. And he got pissed, and quite rightly so. I would have been pissed as well. Yeah, yeah. I don't think so, I paid much attention to him because I wasn't, I was never really into him. He's one of those people, yeah, I'm not so much into him now. At the time, I did like him. I wasn't huge, huge, but he, mm-hmm. I know he was a fan favorite. There's a lot of people in the crowd that were happy to see him and were not happy that his set was cut. Yeah. So... We'll then move on to, in many ways, the main course of the evening because for the the two people I was most going to see at this festival were the specials and Iggy Pop. And it was the first time I saw Iggy Pop. And, hit, and those two sets were my favorite of the day, Iggy and the specials. And I had been following Iggy for a number of years, so I was really excited to see him. And I thought his set was fantastic. I don't remember. I remember him. I don't remember any of the songs. <laughs> he had just. He was just coming out with that album Party, which is well, a lot of his albums after from eighties onwards, they're kind of patchy. Um, it's not a great album overall, but there's a few good songs on there like Bang uh-huh. Bang, and yeah. I remember him doing some of those. I just remember I was so excited to see him, and he just did not disappoint. The set was fantastic. You remember more than me because I don't remember the set at all. I remember getting, I remember, I think I was try, I'm trying to get as close as possible. I do remember sort of making my way through to the crowd to try and get to the front. The one thing for me that's super clear about the Iggy Pop set is that we got pretty close. Mm-hmm. And when he was on, there was this couple beside us, this almost kind of like biker couple, male and female biker couple. Uh-huh. And through the whole set, after every song, the guy would yell, fucking A, Iggy, fucking A. And she'd go, <laughs> give her shit, Iggy, give her shit. <laughs> and it was after every number. <laughs> that's the stuff that sticks in my mind. It was just really funny. And that's all they were saying, repeating this over and over. And then finally one said, do you want to go somewhere we can get a bit closer? Oh, yeah, sure. And then they took off. <laughs> but, but that's my memory of that. It was pretty funny. <laughs> I'm I'm sure I can remember when you talk as you're saying things. I'm mean, bits and pieces are flashing, and I, I'm sure I remember hearing some girls shouting, "You know, get your cock out!" <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing he didn't after that request, but I know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so then after Iggy came the Go Go's, who I didn't yeah. really know, and I yeah. gotta admit, I really wasn't all that big on the set because Iggy Pop had been on, the specials were about to follow, and that was, uh, I was just so waiting to hear them. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking after every number, okay, you can go now. I just, I <laughs> probably would enjoy the Go-Go's now, but it was like, yeah. I just want to get on to the specials. That's why I'm here. Um, yeah. And uh, they were just, I think Beauty and the Beast had just been released, and it wasn't a hit. Yeah, I think it happened that fall. Yeah. So they had um, they had a following in California, but they weren't really known here. 
Yeah. And we were talking earlier and you were saying you were surprised how far up in the set that they were. Yeah, yeah. I do remember them, though. I remember Belinda Carlisle wearing, like, a shiny gold lame kind of thing and Jane Wheedling wearing, like, a green Peter Pan type outfit and she just seemed to be spin round the whole time. She didn't seem to stop. Just like, I was thinking, how is she playing and spinning at the same time? Just like round and round and round and round the whole time. Cool. Actually, that I hadn't remember. That's cool. This this is what I love speaking to different, speaking to people who have been yeah. at events because everyone has different memories. So when you put mm-hmm. all the memories together, you get this more fulsome picture of what yeah. happened. Yeah. So I can manage to get even closer to the front. Um, well, that probably, again, they they were high up on the bill, probably because of their connection with the specials, because the Go-Go's had opened for, the, opened for the specials on their first American tour, and of course, Terry Hall wrote Our Lips Are Sealed with mm-hmm. Jane Wheedland, and yeah. of course, the Go-Go's and Fun Boy 3 each covered that, but that's about their private affair they were having while on tour. Yeah. So if the specials were on the bill, I, th- I have a feeling that's probably one of the that reasons. Been, yeah. Oh, yeah. actually, also, what am I thinking? The Go-Go's were on IRS records. Miles Copeland, Stuart uh, Copeland's brothers, yeah. Abel. So that probably that also probably played a big part. I bet that was probably the reason. And then the specials came on, I think, about eight thirty, nine o'clock. And they were just, they again, as with Iggy, they did not disappoint. So I know that you two were a big fan of the band. What what mm. were your memories from this set, or what what did you think of the set? I thought it was an amazing set. I remember the energy, the dancing. Everybody, they all just was like all over the place. I remember Jerry Dammers, one time, sort of on top of his keyboard and playing backwards. And I was thinking, how's he doing that? He's gonna fall. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, just to, uh, I, I was just so hyped by seeing them. You know, other people probably would have thought they might have been crap, but I was just so excited by seeing them. They could have sung the telephone book, and I would have enjoyed it. Well, my memory is that, of course, the police were the headliners, and most people there were there to see them. But there was a lot of people there to see the specials. Yeah. And here in Canada, again, they'd actually done pretty well. Their albums had weren't like number one, but they were in like the top 20 and top 30. So they had a pretty sizable following here. And I know that like they'd been my one of my favorite bands in the previous two years. And I was like as Iggy and the specials, these are acts I had waited years to see. Mm-hmm. What you were mentioning about the energy, that's what I really, well, there's several things I remember with their set, but one of them was the energy, uh, just completely, you know, like they just didn't stop the whole time they were on. I'm sure there was probably enhancements to make that happen, but uh, they were, they were just on fire and the energy was up and it was an incredible show. The two things I most remember about the set that's always the thing I remember the most of the whole day is do you remember when Rhoda Dakar came out and did the boiler? Yes. The, Cause it's this, this high energy set with all this going on and she did this song. None of us knew it. You yeah. know, she's talking about, you know, sexual violence and misogyny and, and it's this, uh, like sort of all this is going on. And then she does this song, which today is a song. I can't really listen to it. It's incredibly mm-hmm. powerful, but I, it's about a woman being raped and what's going through her mind as she's, as, as she's going through it. Yeah. And it's very effective. It's an incredible piece of art, but I can't listen to it. It's just too upsetting. I've not listened to it for years. I don't even know if I can get a copy of it, but I'm sure you probably could. But I mean, I've not listened to it for, for a long time. I ha- Well, I have the vinyl 45. I still have yeah. that. And it would be on Spotify, too, I'm pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. But I just remember the absolute shock. And when she gets to the end of the song where she's screaming, I remember big chunks mm-hmm. of the audience screaming along with her, not like literally people were freaking out. It was so powerful. Yeah. Um, that's actually one of the most powerful moments of a performance I think I've ever seen anywhere. Mm-hmm. 
and I remember it took a couple of songs before things got back, but that was like a whoa that stands out for me. Yeah. The other was yeah. that summer they just had their number one with Ghost Town. I remember mm-hmm. that doing them doing Ghost Town. Yeah, I remember that one as well. I just, yeah, I thought they were absolutely amazing. One thing I've not been able to confirm, I think that that was either their last show or one of their last shows because they broke up right after that. Yeah. I Yeah, I don't think it was that much longer, was it, that they split up? Yeah, that was that was pretty much it. And I, I saw on YouTube one of the guys from Much Music interviewing Terry Hall after the gig, and he said something like, so why is it taking you so long to come back to Canada to play? And he was like, because we didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I actually saw the specials many years later, and they yeah, were great. Well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you oh you've seen that? Oh, you saw them performed as well? Yeah, at Glastonbury, another festival. <laughs> when was this? Like, about um, it was when they first got when they first reformed back with Terry Hall, and yeah. you know it was like the full band again, other than Jerry Dammers. Yeah, that's so, when I saw. It, as well. uh, yeah, about yeah, yeah, late two thousands was it? Yeah, something like that. It was 2009. Because, I, yeah, I would have seen them just a couple of years after that. Yeah. And I and it worked well because, actually, at this gig at the Police Picnic, they mostly focused on more the second album, more specials, and the new yeah. EP. The second time I saw them, it was pretty much the first album, so it was a yeah. good balance. What really came across when I saw them the last time was Terry Hall was, how about we use the word grumpy? No, oh, yeah. <laughs> and so, and, I, and I've since then learned that, you know, I think he's bipolar and, and that, so that was yeah, probably that, what that, was that. behind it. But remember in both gigs, him not exactly being a knees up kind of guy. No, no. Um, I remember, well, I remember years, did I tell you when I, I, I saw him in London? When yeah, I, lived in I, London? I remember that. Tell this again. This is a good story. Uh, when I was I'd finished work, I was on my way to the tube station. I put my iPod on to shuffle, and the specials came on uh, on my iPod. And just as the song was getting into, like, maybe midway through, I walked past a cafe, and Terry Hall was there, sat outside having a coffee. <laughs> I thought, oh, my God, that's a bit, it was a bit freaky. And then I thought, should I go and say hello? And I thought, no. It's famously, you know, I just thought, no, he'd probably tell me where to go. <laughs> In this case, that may have been the correct decision to yeah. uh, <laughs> to make in this circumstance, and then after from what I, I understand. And then after I saw him that time, I saw him again another couple of times <laughs> having a coffee outside a cafe. Not the same one, a different one, but in the same area in Islington and London. So he but, probably lived in the area, would be yeah, my assumption. Probably, yeah, yeah. I would I would think so. So the specials were amazing. They finished what I another thing that really stays with me from the day is it took the police forever to come on. Like it was a couple oh, yeah. of hours between the specials and the police. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember waiting and waiting and waiting and getting more and more and more fed up and um yeah because I was like right right at the front by that point. And then you could just feel the crowd pushing behind. Because we were getting, one thing I'll say, I like, the, I like the police. I particularly like the first two albums. The third one I wasn't as keen on, and they were actually, Ghost in the Machine was just about to be released. I think this was a week or two before. So right. they were pre-promoting the album. They did a chunk of that album. But it's actually one of the very few shows I've ever been to where we left halfway through oh, the set. Yeah. Oh, right, okay. Because we had been standing out in the hot sun all day. We'd been there for hours and hours, and I just remember the time after the specials and before the police, it was interminable. And we all had to work in the morning. We had an hour and a half drive, and the police came on, and we, and I have went on to see them twice more and really enjoyed yeah. them. Yeah. I didn't like them this first time especially after like the high energy sets of the specials and Iggy Pop, 
it was just this is really dragging and going on and on. So all three of us looked at each other and went, yeah, let's go. <laughs> okay, okay. So this is it. This is what answers that question from the beginning of the episode. This is the third first of the episode. It was the first show I ever walked out on. Finding this out is probably the most fun you've had all day with your clothes on. Okay, back to me and Mr. Guest. The sting wasn't in fine voice either. Oh, that I don't recall. Can you talk more about that? Well, I remember at one point he, he had to excuse. He said, oh, sorry, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat tonight. So I'm not, you know, he, he admitted himself that he wasn't up to, up to it. Oh, wow. I, I've forgotten that part. That's really interesting. I can't recall that. That's neat. Yes, and there you go. But I remember, I remember just before, I, be, through, I think it throughout the day, it was just before when there were people waiting for him to come on and there was girls screaming because they thought they could see him in the background and, you know, because you could see right underneath the stage and through the backstage area. Yeah. Um, and there was, like, people screaming every time they thought they could see him. Um it, like you said, they they weren't at their best, and they had they you know I've seen them a couple times after that as well, and they were better. Yeah. But that, maybe maybe it was a combination of it was a long day. They were on late. Um, I was probably tired. I was absolutely knackered, um, and um, I was being crushed by loads of people behind me, and he he wasn't in fine voice. So. Yeah, that's that's what I remember. And you're and you're probably right. It was a combination of everything because we were just exhausted and fed up because the whole day there'd been a lot of acts, which was great. But that long, long trek and we were like, are they ever coming on? Mm. Part of me is wondering it. Well, now that you mentioned the thing about Sting's voice, I wonder if that had to do with it. Because at the time, my thoughts were, they're not coming on because the specials just blew them off the stage. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's it, this is one of a handful of sort of paid gigs that I've gone to where I've walked out on a headliner. Trying to, what was, I, uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers was another one. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not been many. But... The day itself, the day itself was exciting, and I, as we were both talking, we both went on to see them do better shows, and in fact, Police Picnic 2 and 3 are coming up in the series, and I thought they played great sets at both. Yeah, yeah. Were you at either or both of those? Both of those, yeah. Okay, I'll be speaking to you about uh, (laughs) both of those as well. Um, Yeah, I probably have a a few more memories of those two than I did of the first one. Well, hang on to those memories. I'll be coming back for them. Okay. And so after the show, what what happened? How did you get home? Uh, Do you have any memories of that? Um, Well, we went back. So I was was with my sister and her boyfriend and a couple of other friends. And I just remember um, getting in the car, probably falling asleep. It was like I probably all fell asleep. Um, but I remember it seemed to, it felt like it was taking forever to get out of the car park. Yes. And we left early. One of the things that I remember from the day and the evening is when we drove down, there was the main parking lot for the festival and it was this huge field and it was free. And across the road, uh, out in the country, there was this smaller parking lot where they were charging people, I think five to $10 to park the car, you know, which is almost, um, let me just bring the ticket itself was $20. So I remember the three of us pulling up and pulling into the free parking lot. And there was like a handful of people paying this money to park across the street. We were like, what a bunch of idiots. You've got this free parking lot and they're paying to park. Mm. Meanwhile, at the end of the night, even though we left early as obviously a lot of other people did as well, uh-huh. It was two hours trying to get out of there. Meanwhile, that parking lot across the street, which people had paid for, and there was only a handful of cars, they just got in their cars and drove off. So at that yeah. point, we realized maybe they weren't so stupid after all. Yeah. <laughs> Live and learn. That's definitely. So do you have any final memories, anything else you remember from the day? Yes, sir. I remember seeing Catherine O'Hara there. Ah! Because sure, we were stood, we were sort of sat 
and we had uh, our blanket and whatever we were sat by sort of like a fence area which went sort of like to there was another backstage area um to and she was there and we saw her walking walking back you know walking along we were shouting catherine catherine oh, and she cool. just kind of waved over to us and that was about it oh man. Um, <laughs> so that was cool very um, cool and so then, I think we both grew up on SCTV. Yes. <laughs> it's still one of my favorite shows ever. Yes, I like and I followed. What's that? I, I I like watching the clips that I can find on on uh, YouTube. I've got all I've got the box sets from the first few years, which I've been in the process of rewatching. I always do that every few years, but yeah. that she was my favorite. Well, her and Andrea. And then I love all the Christopher Guest movies. And then, of course, I'm the biggest Shit's Creek fan in the world, starting right from episode one. Yeah. So I am ex- so happy to see her and all those people get all the recognition they deserve. Yeah. But oh, yeah, it is. It's great. Good for her. That's really cool that you actually, wait a minute, you saw her twice. You saw her at a bar in Toronto. <laughs> I did, yeah. She was stood next to us. <laughs> and we what see. was... What was that? Uh, it was a Valentine's Day event. I think her sister, Mary Margaret O'Hara, was yeah. singing there. Or? Mary Margaret O'Hara was singing because um, uh, we went to see a band called, uh, we went to see Hoi Polloi. Yep. Um, that's who we went to go and see and didn't know who Mary Margaret O'Hara was until afterwards. And I think it's Steve Blinky. Was there a guy called Steve Blinky? Yeah. And at the time, yeah, I think he was headlining. So there was there and yeah, so we were stood getting a drink and Sue was next to me and she started poking me in the side. I was going, wow, what, what are you doing? She was like, look, look at next, look, look. <laughs> like, oh my God, it can't be my hair. And we didn't say anything to her and she stood next to us. <laughs> That's cool. It's, it's cool when the only time I've had something like that happen would have been the first time I saw Rufus Wainwright. And, uh, and I was a huge fan of the first album, waiting for him to come on. And I was standing, the bar at Barrymore's in Toronto. Hey, thanks there, buddy. It's uh, the narrator back. Of course, that was a dropout you just heard. Uh, one of the downsides uh, to using Zoom or Skype. And of course, Barrymore's is not in Toronto. It's in Ottawa. I have no idea why I said that. I guess I was just being a silly goose. Anyway, we'll go back. Guy, do your thing. Great. And, you know, there's just people lined up at the bar waiting, and I just kind of glanced to one side and realized I was standing next to Kate McGarrigal. So I didn't say anything, but it was like, oh, God. So anyway, that's very cool that you uh, that you got to see Catherine twice. I know, yeah. I've seen Kate McGarrigal in Manchester. Really? Um, well, With not, Anna? not in concert, no. We went to see, it was the second night. You know he wrote that opera? Rufus yes. Wainwright, um, and it premiered, it made its world premiere in Manchester, and we were living in Manchester at the time, because it was a part of the Manchester Festival, so mm-hmm. we went, we had tickets, we managed to get s- tickets for the second night it was on, um, and she was there, Rufus was there, just Loudon Wainwright was there. Wow, it was a family affair. Yeah, they were there. Neil Tennant from the Pet Shop Boys was there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just like walking through. He was like walked right past us. And then I saw uh, uh, this this friend of ours at the time. She was sort of sat um, nearby. So I, in, during the interval, I went and sort of sat, um, went, stood and chatted to her. And I was leaning. There was a woman sort of in between. And I was like leaning over. And then I was like, oh, I'm really sorry. And I said to her. And it was... Um, Corinne Bailey Ray. <laughs> oh, neat. Okay. Yeah, so I was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> Everyone out and around that evening. Yeah, well, yeah, because it was like the second night of, you know, of the premiere of the of his opera. So. Well, thanks once again, special guests, for dropping by with all your great memories, and uh, there's some really wonderful stuff in there. Yes, it's always a pleasure. Well screamed, pal. Nice going. Just a reminder to visit the MyLifeInConcert.com website and the MyLifeInConcert.com YouTube channel. Listen to our Spotify playlists that all begin with MLIC followed by a greater than prompt. 
as well as like, follow, and subscribe on Facebook and Instagram. To contact me, your host, various artists, you can message me at the website or Facebook page or at info at mylifeinconcert.com. Also, please remember, if you're interested, check out the new My Life in Conversation discussions with creative series featuring the one and only Robert Margoloff discussing Edie Sedgwick and 1972's Chow Manhattan, which he produced. Thanks so much for tuning in to episode 15 of MyLifeInConcert.com and the other episodes. Coming up next in the series, Electropop comes to London, Ontario on a freezing March evening with Liverpool's orchestral maneuvers in the dark, or as they're often just simply known as OMD. Their 1980 debut album was the second album from that emerging UK electronic scene, uh, following Gary Newman's Replicas, which was the first one I really got into. But I loved that first OMD album far more, and it's still a favorite. It's still one I play all the time. And I particularly remember repeat playing it throughout that whole fall of 1980. The show ended up being egregiously delayed, but OMD more than made up for it, playing a blazing set to a small but dedicated audience who danced right through the whole thing. Also, London's own Metal, featuring former Demix guitarist Rob Brent, also delivered a terrific opening performance. Special guests will once again return. Yep, he's coming back with his memories of the show. So stay tuned for Adrenalized Energy, Happy Hoofers, and frozen winkle pickers in episode 16 concert number 10 electricity orchestral maneuvers in the dark with metal centennial hall london ontario canada tuesday march 9th 1982 so until we meet up at the next show bye for now <laughs>